Newly elected Empress Cockatelia and Emperor Steve, members of the Imperial Court, the guests, I welcome you to this gathering at the command and invitation of the widow Norton, Empress Juan Jose. Now, once again, we have gathered on this little knob of civility in the midst of urban tranquility to remember with fond affection the life of Emperor Norton I. The community, gay community of San Francisco was very, was all uh, running around like chickens with their heads cut off and I wanted to unite them once again as they were when I was ruling the city. So I decided to become the Empress Jose Norton the first and I united the community and in so got the approval of the straight community before the gay community. And to make it have a purpose, I said that we would be a fundraising, helping community for those people who did not have as much as we did. We've opened soup kitchens, we clothed the poor, we helped the young people who had a problem with their sex identity. And we did it with tongue in cheek and a little fun. The court grew very fast. We called ourselves the Court of San Francisco. Pretty soon, there was a court of Los Angeles. There was a court of Santa Monica. There was courts all over. In six years, we had the first courts out of the state. Portland, Oregon. Seattle and Vancouver, BC. How we started to go out to the Empress grave was started in the year 75. I'd come back from the World's Fair in Spokane, 74. And uh, since I was his widow, and since I needed to have the affirmation of the public behind what I did in raising money in the name of the emperor and also carrying on his, what he stood for. He was a very humanitarian man. Uh, we decided that it was, I should go out and dust his grave off. The first time was hysterical. I went out with Bobby Kramer, who was then the emperor, and the emperor that followed him was Hector Navarro and his mother who was visiting us from New York. Myself and two other people, Gardner and the kid. And we went out there very quietly. I rented a limousine and I put on the widow's weeds. We met in the Starlight Room in Montmartre Street and drove out there with some flowers. And I really didn't know what the park would think about this, so we didn't tell them. We drove in, put the flowers down, kind of thought a little bit, reminisced about the emperor. We said, wouldn't it be nice if we could have a lot of people out here? Nobody thinks of the old coot. Well, we thought of it, jumped in the car, and we're leaving. Well, just as we get to the entrance of the park, this little chubby man stands there and stops the car. And they said, oh my God, I wonder what happened. And he stopped us and says, uh, where have you been? We said, to the emperor's grave. He said, oh, uh, are you relatives of the emperor? Well, that's impossible. There's nobody, he was a bachelor, a Jewish gentleman who came from Africa in 1849 with $40,000. And uh, no, we just came to put some flowers on his grave. And he turned to the people in the car and asked who they were. And they stated, I'm Mrs. Caceres from New York. And when he came to me, I looked very regal and I turned to him and I said, I'm the widow Norton. I'm the emperor's widow. He looked at me and he said, would you mind all of you stepping into my office? 
So we stepped into the office, and Bob says, there you are, opening your mouth. God only knows what will happen to us. And I says, well, we are, I am his widow, that's all. If you believe something, it's true. So we walked into the office. He bawled us out for not letting the park know that we wanted to come there. Because it's, it seems that nobody did pay any attention to the old emperor. Nobody would put flowers. And he thought that was a very nice gesture. And when I told him how I became his widow, he chuckled and laughed and he said, you know, we would like to know the next time you come out. Would you come out next year? And we always came out on an anniversary of, when his, of his proclamation or an anniversary of when he died because it all happened in February. So I said, yes, we'll be out next year. And he said, fine. You let us know the day. The only thing we ask is that you come and you are out of the park by at least 12 o'clock because that's one of our busiest days. And I said, fine. So that was in 1974, and I've been going out every year since then. And it was three years after we started to come out there that they decided to serve us a continental breakfast. The smallest group, I think, that ever went out there was around 400 people, and the largest group were around 600. I advertise it. It's open to the public, costs nothing. I rent the buses, and I put a show together, which usually takes about an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and a half. And everybody goes away laughing and ha having a wonderful time. Silly as it may be, it's a fun time. Uh, we all have to die, so we might as well do it with a smile on our face. That is my trips to the cemetery, always in February and always well received. We are going to be in for a bumpy ride. So my advice is, hang on. What happened, Thomas? The wrong bus. It's Japanese tourists. <laughs> Good morning. How are you Good doing? Good morning. How's my drag burn? Do I still have any eyeliner? Can you see? On? Oh, God. Is it reflecting in the lens? Well, I look better, but I feel pretty good. <laughs> and um, I don't really feel like I should be necessarily going to a cemetery this morning, but that's where we're going. To pray for the, uh, the old man, Joshua, you know? The widow's husband. I'm so happy to be up at 8 o'clock in the morning after getting in at 2.30 in the morning. It's always given me great pleasure to get the queens up early in the morning. It's a very San Francisco morning, all stepping out of the Mark Hopkins Hotel where they've been housed and all getting ready for a ride to my late husband's uh, grave site. Which, of course, they don't know what they're in for. Oh, there comes the older queen from New York. Demonico, yes. Billy Ann Demonico. When she's dressed up, she looks just like Ann Miller. Who is speaking in such a way? She knows who I mean. She knows who I mean. Good morning. I thought this bus was going to be a sleeper. I know. Here they are traveling, going down to Coma. In 1932, all the cemeteries were removed from San Francisco. That gave people work for the New Deal, you know, a job for everybody. My father worked on that. He helped dig up the bodies and, and all, and they were all located outside of the city and county of San Francisco. Right now, as they arrive, they're all having what we call a continental brunch. Orange juice, tomato juice, pineapple juice, a table of delicacies, coffee and tea. I mean, it's a little bit of a surprise because you don't go to a cemetery usually to eat. However, that, that it is supplied by the park, the, the, the park people. They have a very, very nice a setup and oh there I am oh I look pretty good I got my new veil on 
I always seem to lose my veils. I just don't know. I don't pin them hard, and hard enough into my hat. <laughs> KWF, what does that stand for? Can't you read? <laughs> Not from that distance. Uh, How uh, dare you speak to me in that tone? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it stands for Ken Will Fuck. <laughs> Leather boys are the ones that carry the guns and fire them. <laughs> People here who need assistance up the hill, you mean not to be too hungover that you can't walk up it, but it's easy. Oh, in the band, San Francisco Gay Lesbian Band, and here they are all lined up marching up the hill. It's a very fast ascent. We, this is the year that we had quite a few, we had close to five to six hundred people there. They're all marching up, full of vim and vigor, and they usually play San Francisco, here I come. And the flags. Oh, my car. I ride a car which was given to me by the leading Chinese funeral parlor, as you all know. They always have a uh, special car with the picture of the deceased. Here we have all the various royalties from all over the United States marching up. <laughs> and we have Texas going by, naturally they have their own flag. The Sisters of Perpetual Help. Oh, the Vestal Virgins. Transsexuals. They are not gay, but they like to dress up, so I've given them a title. It's a big representation from New York that year. I know. Oh, oh that's so distressing. Push me up this hill. <laughs> you walk backwards, it feels like you're going down. You know what I mean? Well, please, not too close. I'm not made up. <laughs> I want a picture of him in the hat that he refuses to wear Wait a minute, because he thinks it looks silly. It's silly! I hate silly And here is the San Francisco pom pom players. They're all marching up very nicely. Oh my goodness, they're all getting information. Ah, oh, we're getting close to the cemetery now. I'm being escorted in by a gentleman who is the Commissioner of Cultural Arts of San Francisco, who is a recipient of the French Legion of Honor, and he wears his medal. It's very, very nice. Members of the Imperial. And now we have the invocation yes, by my favorite little minister. All the land in front of the Empress Cave has not been sold since they've been trying to convince me that I should be buried there. To remember with fond of Here's the tombstone. Emperor Norton the first, Emperor of these United States and protector of Mexico. I need uh, my glasses. We will be welcome to this beautiful territory of my bastard son. <laughs> See the play.
She has Nicole and Jackie and them waiting in the wings so I want to be careful not to slip. <laughs> As you were driving down the boulevard of Colma, you would see a little person as small as I am blocking and stopping traffic in the middle of the road. That was the Empress Melvina. She stopped, she would stop my entourage and I would have to get out and pay toll to come into her city. And while she was collecting from me, she would collect from the tourists that didn't know what the hell was going on. This is the year that I finally conceded and said that if they wanted to purchase the land in front of Emperor Norton's grave, I would let them do it. So they have a sign on that area that says, sold, this property has been sold. <laughs> she needs some slave boys to carry her over. There was supposed to be some litter, but I found out it was a bag of kitty litter. <laughs> oh, here my roommate. She sober and she fell down and broke her ankle. Bar shooters will now fire the salute. I would take care, Nicole. <laughs> oh, and here they're firing the gun salute. Oh, my goodness, there they go. I told them to aim at the old empresses, but they never did. And it's rather fun to watch the boys when they get their commands and they they never seem to fire all at once. There's always one or two that it pops afterward. The rest of virgins of the land of San Francisco will do their incantation. <laughs> Oh, here are the virgins. Oh, my dear, they're all in beautiful white flowing gowns and maidenhair head pieces. They are absolutely hysterical. The place just fell apart. Now we're marching out. Yep, here we go down. It's always easier to come down. And they march in cadence. And everybody is coming down laughing. Oh my goodness, oh, it's almost a who's who in San Francisco society. Michael Spring, uh, we have the members of the Court of New York there. Oh, Miss, Miss Bumpus, leader in, in, she works for Disneyland now. She used to own the, the bookstore. And here comes New York with their Statue of Liberty headpieces. Well, it's a little sprinkly now, and uh, uh, they've kind of got the umbrellas and they're kind of rushing to the cars, and I say, here comes the Vestal Virgins all ripped up, wrapped up. Oh, yeah, that was a very fun thing. From that time to this date, 1998, there are 67 courts in the United States, Canada, Alaska, Hawaii, and Mexico. We have grown into one of the largest gay fundraising organizations that exists today. And we are very proud of what we are doing. We are finally getting recognition from the national organizations, uh, which gives us great pride. I'm the first gay person to run for public office in the United States. I changed the thought of politicians. They know we exist. They know we 
put them in and take them out. I, I was doing charitable work long before the court system. Very politically minded, and of course in those days one could be that. Uh, the court system are non-profit corporations, so therefore they cannot be political as a unit. But individually you can. So I had to change what we were doing, and it was to help the underprivileged. But at the same time, we're a strong force politically. But that's how it was. People think that it was always like that. It wasn't. In the beginning, I was very, I wanted uh, the gay community to be part of whatever city or town that they lived in. And the only way you can be a part of that is to be part of the community. Be a volunteer fireman. Try to be a police officer. Dog catcher. Go down and help the charities that help the people. And that's what we did. And that's what I advocated. And then I thought it was a little bit more easier to do it if we put on a dress and and a crown, and we did it with a little bit of flair. You know, be different, be successful. Well, it's proven itself. We are, we have a lot of fun doing it. We raise a lot of eyebrows, but better, we raise a lot of money. And that is what's fun.